<laughs> and we should be live. Hello and welcome to this uh, Zooniverse live chat on the sixth anniversary of what turned out to be the first Zooniverse project, Galaxy Zoo. So I think it's particularly appropriate that we've got scientists from lots of projects as well as technical lead Arvid Smith right here. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the future tools that we've been working on. We've been gathered here at the Adler Planetarium for most of the last three days. People haven't slept. There have been fights and tears of blood uh, as we struggle to produce the tools for the citizen science of the future. Uh, before we get on to that, though, I'm going to let my colleagues who are scattered around the building introduce themselves, uh, starting with the man to my left, Arvind. Hi, I'm Arvon Smith. I'm technical lead for the Zooniverse and director of citizen science here at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, so I've been uh, working with all the scientists and developers over the past few days trying to uh, build some cool stuff for the Zooniverse. So we're going to talk about that a bit more. Uh, let's go. Let's keep going this way. So that's Kyle next for me. Not from my perspective, but <laughs> uh, I'm Kyle Will. I'm a postdoc at the University of Minnesota. And I'm a member of the Galaxy Zoo team, so most of the tools that I've been building in the last couple of days have been focused on the new Galaxy Zoo data and uh, better ways to visualize and interact with it. Yeah. Our next to Kyle is... Ali. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> setting her... Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's called an open link. It's the little setting we use. I'm Ali Swanson. I'm from the University of Minnesota, working on the Snapshot Serengeti team. Uh, and so one of the really cool things we've been doing the last few days is, is coming up with ways to map where the animals are on the cameras through space and time. Cool. Excellent. And uh, moving upstairs to a, build, a room we'll say more about in a second, uh, we have uh, Meg. Hi, I'm Meg Schwalm. I'm an NSF postdoc at Yale. Um, I work on Planet Hunters and Planet 4 and been working on tools for plant hunters here this week. And last but not least, um, somebody who is only recently an addition to the Zeros. Uh, I'm Lucianne Walkowicz, and I'm a postdoc in the Department of Astrophysical Sciences at Princeton. And in a year, I'll be an astronomer here at the Adler Planetarium. Very cool. OK, so we have all these awesome people in the building. Why? Good question. Uh, so there is a uh, obviously a collection of projects on the Zooniverse. They're all in a range of disciplines. Uh, Galaxy Zoo first six years ago. Um, something that we know creates um, interesting scientific results is when we, um, if people see something unusual in an image, maybe it's a fuzzy green blob in Galaxy Zoo, or maybe it, it's a, a strange animal in, in on the Serengeti. When they can take that question and do something sort of pursue that question in some way. And at the moment, um, it depends really on the uh, research area that we're working in, whether there's any way that you can ask more of the data that we have. And so we were very lucky with Galaxy Zoo um, that there were a whole collection of tools that were made uh, to go with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data that allowed you to go and look at spectra of the object or to go and uh, look at the color of it. Look at what the maybe the professional astronomers would have looked like, looked at uh, to begin their research questions. And so we could link to these tools, and people use them, and some really lovely results like uh, the Galaxy Zoo Green Peas, like some of the uh, I guess Hannes Wahlberg was originally interrogated in those kind of environments, looking at looking at the data behind these objects. These are this was a luxury we had with Galaxy Zoo, but we don't have that with lots of our other projects. And so um, we think that's a problem, and we think that's something we can address. And so we've been working over the past, I guess really full time on this for about the past 18 months, uh, but on and off for a bit longer, on a thing that we're calling Zooniverse Tools. And they're in a kind of a beta uh, state at the moment, but um, we're going to be releasing them over the next couple of weeks. And the point is to create tools that allow you to take a galaxy, picture of a galaxy or maybe a, a light curve from Planet Hunters and ask some more questions. So maybe you think you've seen a planet you want to look at, you want to fold the light curve, the first kind of things you might do if you were trying to work out if it was a real planet signature. Um, we're building a tool to do that. Um, we're looking at uh, a whole bunch of different things. And I'm going to let people talk about what they've been working on these days. But um, we've That's created great. a platform to do this. And so, yeah. 
before we actually get onto the specific tools, I was going to ask, I don't know who wants this, but we've got a bunch of scientists. What's it like working with the Zooniverse development team? Awesome. <laughs> well, well, it's a compliment, so yeah, I find it very strange. Yeah, as, as we can also, really? we can also <laughs> show some of them, too. Yes. <laughs> well, you bet, well, at this point, you better show where you are, Meg, I guess. If you've got well, yeah, so I think you can see on the screen that is uh, Zooniverse UH, uh, USHQ, right, in the floor of the Adler Planetarium. Um, maybe, Arvin, or you want to talk a little bit more about it in general? So, yeah, we're, uh, there's about 12 of us here in the Adler, uh, developers, uh, designers, educators who build new Zooniverse projects um, in collaboration with the Oxford team primarily. Um, the, the space we're in is actually on the museum floor, so if you come and see us uh, at the Adler in Chicago, um, we're, on the, we're on the sort of first floor down, and we affectionately refer to it as the fishbowl. That's because uh, it's, we're surrounded by glass. But um, in between Luciana and Meg, we can see Michael's head. He's standing at his stand-up desk there. We, you know, it's basically a bunch of uh, people standing at computers building projects. But it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, and like, a bit like CSI, we write up all our stuff on the glass, uh, uh, on the glass uh, windows and stuff. It's a really fun place to work. And, and we really have a sneak view awesome. right now. So right up on the screen is actually the other perspective. Uh, oh, cool. You've got that. Room. So right. you can see the glass windows and the people walking by and some of the right. developers who are working right. are hard at work right now. Right, cool. Well, if you can't make it to the Adler, by the way, we, you should. You can also tweet during the live chat at the underscore Zooniverse. And if you tweet at us, I will pass questions on. Um, that particularly applies to any science team members who are watching and want to know why their particular tweet to their site hasn't been built yet. <laughs> or do you use the support live on it? Yes. Um, let's get to the specifics. So it's Galaxy Sue's birthday, so Kyle, you get to go first. Um, what tools do you reckon will, will come out of the last few days for Galaxy Zoo volunteers? So Galaxy Zoo has had, a, had a, I think, more of a head start than the other projects that we've been working on. So this has actually been part of uh, my job working as a member of the science team for the past year or so, has been working on some of the earlier version of these tools. Um, and, and the early versions en encompass a lot of uh, what, what I consider more the basic but really critical information for, ex for exploring both individual objects and collections of objects. So things that we have included in the tool database right now, it's, um, I don't know if we'll be able to show this later, but the idea is that we've created an environment within um, part of the website where we have lots of different tools, lots of different modules, and then the idea is that you can pass data back and forth between these tools and talk to each other. So you might use so one of our tools, for example, we have a basic um, a mapping module. So if you, you can import a collection of your galaxies in there, and with one, and with one click, import that and show them show the distribution of the galaxies on the sky, for example. So you can see, are these galaxies centered in the Milky Way? Are they all in one very large, small part of the sky? Is there something about the, the location in which they are which makes them interesting? Um, and one can imagine doing similar things with any sort of astronomical object, like, uh, like uh, planet hunters, for example. Um, so we have a number of, I think, basic tools that allow you to explore the, the properties of it and, and quantify things that are interesting. So this includes things like uh, we have plotting routines that allow you to explore things like the average color, the average brightness, the average size, um, what we call metadata about the galaxies that you're looking at. Um, additional measurements that go beyond just the image that you see on the screen. So in addition to all that, we're trying, we're building the new stuff that we're building this week is stuff that I'm particularly excited about. It's adding to that, and for, for the first time, I think we're going to allow you to visualize the morphological classifications that are taking place on the front end of the site um, through the regular decision tree. So what uh, one of the developers here and I have been working on is a way to, um, to visualize in a neat way the morphology as classified by you, the aggregate users of any given galaxy. So you can see um, having classified a galaxy already, now you can see what the what the agreement level of the overall consensus was as to whether this was is this a barred spiral, is this a clumpy blue galaxy, is this a, a smooth elliptical, for example, and then to use those in a in a really cool way to start to find similar galaxies. And so, if you find an object that you think is genuinely interesting, one might imagine this happened in, this happens a lot, and especially in the early days of Zoo when you found unique objects like the green peas in the forever. And one of our first questions is, is this unique? Are there more things like this in the universe? Or is this something that's very common? Um, so we're, what we're implementing is a way to search both in, I think Chris will talk about his, uh, the tool that he's been working on a little more, but to search both on, 
on, on, in color space and in shape space to find similar galaxies that look like this. And so it's a, it's a much faster way of, of the collections that many of our users have very painstakingly assembled of many interesting categories. We hope we can now streamline that process and find very quickly, here are the three-armed spirals. And now that I have an interesting collection of those, start to play with the data, find out how big they are, how limited they are, what kind of environments they live in, and things that tell you more about the, the actual astronomical properties of what you're looking at. You know, as you were talking then, it, I, was, I, want, I want to go to Ali, and I was going to say that it seems ridiculous that we could build tools that are useful for ecologists as well. And then you started talking about environment and behavior. So um, how, how does taking stuff that was originally designed for astro, um, what, what does that get you when you go to the Serengeti? What have you been up to? Sorry, say that again? I was just asking what you've been working on. Oh. Uh, it's a very long oh. fashion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that, uh, I will say, Kyle, that's, that's a hard, uh, hard bit to follow. You guys have done a lot. Um, right, so, uh, okay, so we've been working on two different things, both of which are really exciting. Uh, I think so. Um, so the first is, uh, is, is giving uh, users a chance to explore the images in a, in a different way than they um, than uh, than you can currently with the with your talk. Um, so I know one of my biggest frustrations when I'm trying to go through the images on Snapshot Serengeti is that I'll come across like a really cool photograph of something crazy happening, like a lion killing a zebra or a two battered foxes chasing an ard wolf, um, and I really want to know what happened after that, um, and so I. It, Cameras are capturing a story, right? Like, we've got 225 cameras set up. They're taking pictures from one spot. It's like a pair of eyes, like 225 sets of eyes watching the Serengeti. And it's that, um, the, the progression of photographs through time that really tells a story about a place. Uh, and so the first thing that we, we're doing is building a, a subject viewer so that um, folks can go to the dashboard, uh, select a site, that they want to want to explore, and then uh, and maybe even the season that they want to look at, uh, and go through the photos uh, uh, chronologically. Um, so you know, starting today or starting you know two weeks ago, and see what's happening um, every every time the camera snaps a picture. Um, you can also explore by species. Uh, so you know, if you want to see all of the cits or all of the ri the rhinos um, or all of the hippos, which are really entertaining. Um, you can see what they're doing and where they are. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, we're working to, to map uh, where these animals are and how they're moving across the landscape. Um, because uh, that's, that's really at the heart of the science that we're trying to do with Snapshot Serengeti. Um, the cameras are, we're using the cameras in a different way than anybody's ever used camera traps before, and that's to understand how animals are moving across the landscape with respect to each other. And so, uh, um, and so we can actually see that. We've got all of the maps, all of the cameras laid out on a map, and we can uh, um, look through time and see where the wildebeest are in each camera and how they're, uh, they're moving through the cameras on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. Very cool. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be particularly enjoying tracking wildebeest. I have some yeah. opinions among snapshot Serengeti volunteers. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> pigeons of the Serengeti. But, um, I rather like uh, uh, We might get yeah. you to do your wildebeest impression in a bit, Ali. Uh, I, I might be willing to do that. <laughs> if you'd like Ali to do a wildebeest impression during this hangout, please tweet wildebeest to that uh, underscore zooniverse. And if we, if we get and the Super Bowl for the retreats, then, then we'll maybe all join it. Um, we're going to come back and talk in a second uh, about what we've been building for Planet Hunters in particular, which uh, A.G. Benson, or possibly A. Jepson, uh, on Twitter would like us to talk about. Before that, Arvin, why do we care uh, about these tools? Like, why, why do we care that like, the main Zooniverse projects, you know, we have all of these wonderful scientists. They want you to help them do their work. They want you to do that by classifying you people at home, uh, by classifying, by clicking on, a, on an image, by drawing something on a picture of Mars, by looking for a transit. So that sort of makes sense. Why put, I mean, we're having fun, but why put all this effort into building tools that let people do more than that? Right. So I think the um, first thing to realize is that 
you know, Zooniverse projects come with a, a guarantee, really, that we've thought about a research case that we know we can address through your efforts on what I would call the primary interface. So in Galaxy Zoo, that's saying something about the shape of a galaxy on Planet Hunters. It's looking at a light curve and looking for transits. And that's great. We get some lovely papers out of that. We're, you know, the, the, there's lots of great research that comes out. We produce, we produce research from that. But we know that for every project we've launched, the interesting stuff for us, beyond the original science case, really comes from the fact that we've got people looking at data rather than machines, and people are very good at spotting the unusual. So we, you know, we know that interesting. You know, we found planets in Planet Hunters because um, you know the, the, the community has been sensitive to uh, things that algorithms have missed, and you know, arguably the only reason these planets ever got flagged as interesting candidates were because people in the community on Talk were writing Excel script, Excel macros, they were doing these tasks, they were folding like curves, doing the stuff that is the next question that you would ask. Um, you know, this looks interesting. Okay, if it's interesting, I want to know, I want to know these three things about it. Maybe with Kyle's stuff, how unusual is it in color space? Um, you know, how many things are there like this? And so these tools are about just moving you a couple of steps forwards down the path of, yes, I think it's interesting, and, and, and yes, we think we should look at it, study it further. And so we know that amazing science has come from the community in this way, and it's come in spite of us having these tools. So I guess this is us saying, well, imagine if you did have these, then what, what more could you do? So I guess we're in some way building things that um, help um, reproduce what some people are already doing, but when those people are expert programmers, we're trying to make a tool that means that anybody can do it. And so I think that's probably the main reason for me why we're doing it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, we talked about image projects, and you know, we talked about seeing more images and exploring objects, but um, I'm still stunned by Planet Hunters every time I think about it. Uh, these, these are graphs that people are looking at, and yet we've gone through what, like 16 million of these now? <laughs> 19. 19 million. Excellent. We should have a party for 20 million. <laughs> we'll do the these compression again. Uh, I've had it had to sit 20 million. Uh, but let's talk about so, so tools for planet hunters I find a bit more abstract. Um, and so, Lucien, maybe you can talk us through what you've been doing with planet hunters data and with Michael's head behind you. <laughs> Wave, Michael. Sure. <laughs> Well, so what we've been doing um, this week is to create tools that enable people to do a little more in-depth looking at the Kepler data that's used in Planet Hunters. So right now, you can go through and use the usual um, primary interface of Planet Hunters to flag transits and um, maybe do a little bit of characterization of what's happening in these light curves or these measurements of brightness of stars with time. But what we're trying to do this week is to make it possible for you to look more carefully at what the star is doing itself and also to remove that if you want and then be able to look more carefully at the planet signal. So what this enables you to do basically is to you know, take out all of the, um, the stellar signal, all of that variability that comes from just what the star is doing and look at just the planetary transit itself. And then, if you're interested actually in what the planet or what the star is doing, you can now look at that part of the light curve. And you can also look, um, many of these stars, as our users have found, uh, have variability that you know, repeats in some pattern that's either due to the star pulsating or even just rotating and having features on its surface. So, what you can do now is use these new tools we're developing to figure out you know, how often does the star pulse, how often does it rotate around. And that helps you dig into what kind of a star it is and what causes those things that you're seeing in the data. So it really lets you dig deeper with just a very intuitive interface. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is that when I describe this with, to people, I normally say, and that helps us find planets. Because, you know, if you understand the star better, you can get rid of all of this annoying bouncing up and down of variability. And we can have a nice planet cycle. But, um, I know you're interested in the stars themselves, so, so what, maybe you could give us some sort of flavor of, of what stellar astrophysics we should get, or we are getting from the Kepler data. Sure. Um, so I think one of the, the really great things about um, Kepler is not just that it's, you know, this wonderful planet hunting tool, um, but that, you know, not only does it 
find planets and take these amazing measurements of stars, but it helps us really understand um, stars and planets together in systems. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, looking at the stellar variability isn't directly finding the planet, but if you do find that there is a planet around that star, understanding what the star is doing, for example, whether it's pulsating, whether it has lots of magnetic spots and then is likely to have big flares um, that might shower your planet in uh, high energy radiation, you know, that all helps you understand what's going on in this planetary system um, where, you know, really the thing that we can observe is actually just the star. You know, at this point and with this data, we're not seeing the planets, but we can study the system and learn more about it by studying the star. And from a, just a pure kind of stellar astrophysics side of things, you know, nothing um, or very few other kinds of missions have been able to make the kinds of measurements that uh, Kepler can make, makes very, very precise measurements of how the light from stars change with time. And, you know, in some sense, um, what Kepler measures is so tiny and so precise that it's the kind of measurement that we could only make for stars like our sun before. Um, and I mean, you know, not stars like all the stars like our sun, I mean like just our sun. Um, <laughs> and so now we can put our sun and the things that we can measure about, you know, what our sun is doing and how that affects us here on Earth in the context of all these other stars that we're looking for planets around. Um, so it really kind of gives us this whole new window. It's almost like, you know, replacing corrugated glass with something that's clear and transparent in the way that it's changed our ability to study these stars. I think that's one thing. When we were talking, Meg, you and I, just uh, a few weeks ago about the, the sad health of Kepler and, and the fact that its main mission is likely over, I, I, we can only just have begun to scratch the surface of this data. And I, I think seeing some of the digging we've been doing this week has really shown that. I mean, Meg, do you want to talk about how this relates to what else we're up to in Planet Hunters, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, you know, we are exploring the data in, in different ways, and I think that's really exciting. And the nice thing about this tool that we're building is, you know, you get to do the story variability, but also enables you to you know, zoom in into the transit and things like that. And that's, you know, something that, you know, we're finding many candidates coming from talk, and we've been actively following them up. I was at uh, Keck last week. I was in Hawaii trying to get some follow-up observations um, with some, with weather giving me a bit of trouble. But uh, so, you know, I think in terms of, of you know, the things we're finding, we're trying to follow these up and, and, you know, understand what these planets are like as well as, you know, why potentially they were missed. Um, and we're also working on the 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 threshold crossing event uh, uh, review. So we've, we've finished that um, in terms of getting the classification. So thank you. Thank you to everybody who classified these. So these were things that the Kepler automated algorithm thought might be transit-like or might be a transit. And so there's 18,000 of these almost, a little bit more than that. And the Kepler team looks at these by eye and they use other metrics as well to sort of to vet these and decide what they think are, are, are planet candidates. And so we wanted to see, you know, using a sort of science approach, you know, how, do, you know, doing it ourselves, what we can see and, and, and see if there are interesting candidates there that may have slipped through in, in a review with a smaller number of people, you know, doing a very large data set. So I think that's really exciting and I'm slowly getting some results from that, so we're working on it. Um, and you've been playing on Mars as well the last few days. <laughs> also playing on Mars, uh, putting my other hat on. Uh, yeah, I think talking about um, we, we learned we've learned I think this week that Mars is hard, um, <laughs> especially when you're at the pole of a planet. It makes things hard because um, you have to polar projection makes. So this, this is the equivalent of the reason why everyone thinks that Greenland is huge, right? Yes, so exactly. A rectangular map of the Earth, that it looks much bigger than it is. Right, so especially in the poles because everything's converging, those the latitude and longitude lines. So, um, we were we, but we've been having I think really useful and really interesting discussions of what we could do with the Planet Four data, and I think that's been really exciting to see, you know, what things we could do with having all these images from Mars with such high resolution that you could see a coffee table. Um, so yeah, so I think we've been talking a bit about Mars as well, but we've learned it's hard, so might not get done in the, in the three days. But I think there's some interesting ideas that you know we can follow up with. And I hope we follow up with. Cool. What one? We've had no wildebeest tweets, by the way. So if you are missing, amazing. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna get my phone and tweet one right now. <laughs> okay. 
well, somebody has to, otherwise you'll miss out on the real piece. You can tweet that or anything else to the underscore Zooniverse, and we will answer questions. One general question I had, and I know uh, mine who, who answers this one, what sort of, I guess, what sort of knowledge are you assuming that people have when they come to use the tools that we've been describing? Are we talking about, uh, are we building for the Zooniverse's 1%, the people who, who know their stuff? Um, or do you th are things more broad than that? I, I guess the answer depends on what tool you're building. I think I'll take a stab at that. For I think it depends on the project and the tool. Uh, I think we are arguably building for the 50%, actually. I mean, just knowing the kind of patterns of engagement with our projects, I think there's a lot of people who are very casual visitors, and I don't think we're going to necessarily... Um, take people down the path of folding a mic curve, but I think just in the way that we see about 50% of people leave a comment and talk on Planet Hunters, I think this is a similar level of um, curiosity, a curiosity level. So I, I, I don't know, I think it depends on the project, but yeah. Oh, a wildebeest tweet. Yes, <laughs> Kyle, Kyle would like to hear Ali's wildebeest expression, so <laughs> with appropriate reverence, Ali, whenever you feel ready. <laughs> so you mean like the, the just the, the, impre the wildebeest impression, just their noises. Yeah, and when you, Ali ex I should explain that Ali explained to me that if you knew what wildebeest sounded like, then you couldn't possibly hate them, even though it's, they Oh, it's so like true. No, it's so true, especially when there's tons and tons of them right outside your tent, and they're all like, <laughs> <laughs> And then there's one, and then there's one. So they're all, they're all milling around your tent, they're like, <laughs> it's always one. <laughs> it just sounds like a, yeah, <laughs> like you didn't really get it. That's <laughs> really wonderful. We we packed impressions on a Google uh, on a Google Hangout before, but I think that's the largest animal ever impersonated on the Zoom. We'll so. so. give you a prize later. Um, um. <laughs> that actually, the, the way that everyone else reacted to that, and the fact that I see that Brooke from the Galaxy Z team is listening in at Oxford, reminds me that you're all, we're all, as scientists, also citizen scientists on other people's projects. So, I know, just a show of hands, maybe, how many of you have actively used Zooniverse projects other than your own? I thought. Cool, everyone. Well, yeah, they're all yours. Oh. All right. <laughs> so, so, so which projects are you addicted to, or which, which projects have you used, and why? So let's start with Meg. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, I have to admit, it's... it's be nice to your fellow scientists, think about who's listening. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I have two, right? So I can't say when I do, I go to one instead of the other, right? That's not allowed. Um, I actually secretly study live. I don't know why, it's very, it's very calming. So when I just want to, like, relax, I just classify a few. And, well, uh, and I actually got, uh, I got called out on the talk. Um, I actually, like, went to talk, and someone messaged me, who was, like, who was a forum moderator, and said, well, thanks, thanks for coming to my side. Welcome to my project. So I <laughs> there was, of course, the time, because we were at one point going to prioritize Planet Hunters Planets and mm -hmm. setting Life. Actually, we've got some setting Life. It, we, we should be pushing Seti Live shortly. Yeah, I think we will be in the next couple of weeks. Um, we've now got to the point where, um, based on based on your actions in the main interface, we can communicate back to the telescope and go through a chain of um, prioritization for follow-up observations, such that I think a few weeks ago when we were testing it with a bug, we actually, somebody's phone rang at like 2 in the morning because they've got a level 10 signal. I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted to say it was 30 live, but it wasn't real. It was quite, yeah, it was... So <laughs> level 10 means they're already landing on Devil's Tower? Yeah. Uh, it was, um, somebody got very excited and then very annoyed pretty quickly. So, so, nice. so just to confirm, no aliens yet? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Good. Excellent. We could, I'm looking forward to snapshots there and getting on other planets. <laughs> what about you, Lucia? Which, which universe projects have you enjoyed with. Um, I really liked Mergers, uh, Merger Zoo, um, and I'm really this week I've been like sort of jealously looking over my laptop at like Ali developing things. She's being like, oh yeah, like a lion just walked by. So I think I think my uh, heart might go to Snapshot Serengeti after this. <laughs> yeah, you and everyone else, I think. Carl, is it, is it Snapshot for you? 
Um, I think I think everyone likes snapshots, so um, and I'm certainly among them. But also the other one I do I that I like to do a lot when I don't do Galaxy Zoo is old weather. I quite like reading the ship's logs and and especially and especially the the ancillary data, which tells a very a very concrete story about what's going on in interesting times and interesting parts of the world. So I actually quite like old, doing old weather a lot when I'm not doing the astronomy. Pretty cool. And Ali, I didn't see if you put your hand up, but have you been converted yeah. to astronomy? Or are you... Not yet. No, I've, I've, uh, I've dabbled in some of the different projects looking around, but I only just really got back to internet in the last month. Um, so, uh, so I anticipate uh, finding distractions uh, in the next you have, months, the, you have a thesis to write, so it's exactly. perfect timing. So. This is the perfect time for me to become an avid citizen scientist on other people's projects. And what about Chris? What about you? As our as our glorious glorious uh, lead, which is your favorite? I favorite? use seafloor explorer. Strangely, I find this there's something very restful about fish, and I think other people have an aquarium in the corner of their office, and I just have seafloor explorer open in the <laughs> town. Uh, although starfish are menacing. Um, and did you know they eat each other? And so once you know that, seeing a nice pretty picture of many starfish on top of each other becomes a lot less exciting and, uh, you know, cute starfish. They're not called starfish, sorry. Apologies to the seafloor explorer uh, science team. They're called sea stars because they're not fish. Semantics. Right. Whale FM, by the way, doesn't have any whales in it either. It's got only dolphins. Yes. Um, so... Yes, but no, Seafloor Explorer, which is his father. And um, I've become a bit addicted to the project that we haven't launched yet, the next one, the one that begins with P, mm. uh, which I rather like, which is another C. C as yeah. Well. Yeah. Actually, you said you needed some beta testing. We do, actually. If you'd like to beta test another uh, Zooniverse project and you're listening to this Hangout, then email team at zooniverse.org with the word Hangout uh, in the subject. And we will add you to the beta testing list. And if you ever kept sea monkeys, I think you're eminently qualified for this project. Right. Do you know what it is? I do know what okay, a sea good. monkey is. It's not a monkey. No. Not a monkey. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> we should rename them. Anyway, um, I think with that, I think I'm going to bring this hangout to a close. So thank you yeah. to everyone from Julia. So Chris, I have a question. So when when will everyone? What's kind of our plan for when will our users be able to use and see and uh, and interact with these tools? I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say, well, I think the Zooniverse tools are pretty much ready for testing, really. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to probably start uh, seeing uh, seeing us linking to them in talk, uh, and uh, and and then over the next couple of weeks, pushing out some of the stuff we've been working on over this week uh, into into the live environment. So to so the next week or so. Yeah, I think so. Good. We will hold you to that. All right. uh, busy time for. Zooniverse, there's an excellent uh, Galaxy Zoo side project starting. Look at the Galaxy Zoo blog. Um, in fact, there's a Galaxy Zoo hangout on Monday, I think, Carl, on the 15th, um, at some time or other. Um, Planet Hunters is continuing. Snapshot Serengeti Season 5 is underway, um, and the developers continue to develop. So we'll all talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.